Okay, let's say we're looking at the demand for tacos among a particular group of people. Let's say I'm going to survey 10 people and I'm going to figure out what our demand for tacos is for this group. So I'm going to start calling out prices. Let's say it's, it's kind of like an auction. I'm going to start calling out prices. I'm going to pick a high price that I don't expect anyone's going to be willing to pay. So at a price of 15, zero quantity, there are no takers for this particular taco. And now I'm just going to drop the price until someone's willing to buy. So let's say at 14, I've got one taker. So we've got a quantity of one at a price of 14. Now, now we're basing this off of willingness to pay, meaning the maximum that this person is willing to pay for this taco is $14, which seems pretty high. But let's say they're really hungry. It's a pretty good taco. And um, so they don't expect to actually be paying that, most likely. Um, but this, if they really had to, that's the most they'd be willing to pay. And later on, we'll bring in you know, the actual price of this good. But the most they'd be willing to pay is 14. And so now we have one taker. I'm going to keep dropping the price. I'm going to drop the price to 10. And now two additional people are willing to buy when the price drops to 10. We still have that one person there that was willing to pay 14. Two more for a total of three when that price drops to 10. I'm just going to keep doing that. And I just pick some arbitrary numbers here. Drop the price to six. Three more people are willing to buy. Now we have a total of six quantity. Drop the price to four. Now I have nine. And let's say drop it to three. It's still nine. So I'm, in, I'm just, let's assume a group of 10 people keep dropping the price. I'm going to even drop it to zero. Still nine people want to buy. So the 10th person, even if you gave it away at zero, they still don't want it which for a taco isn't too unrealistic unless there's you know, some resale value. I might just not want this thing at any price. So this now becomes our demand schedule for this good. And once I plot this, it's going to become a demand curve. Now, at first, I'm going to assume, just like in this example, we're only allowing discrete units. So you can only have one taco um, or two tacos rather than 1.5, let's say. So if we do that, we're going to plot it like this. So, so imagine I started fr again from that high price where n there were no takers. So I'm going to plot quantity on this axis, price on this axis. That's how we're always going to do it. Drop that price to 14. And now I have one taker. So I'm just going to go out to a quantity of one. I'm just going to keep dropping that price. When I drop to 10, now I move out to a quantity of three. Right. So I create kind of the step curve here. Drop the price to six. I'm going to gain out to six, drop the price to four, I gain the next three people, and so I'm going to complete my curve there at, at, at a quantity of nine, and that becomes my demand curve. Now, we're not usually going to graph a demand curve like this because we, we're going to draw a smooth curve to make it easier to work with. So you could imagine if I surveyed a much larger group of people, imagine this was 900 people, um, a quantity of 900, then you could imagine this is the first hundred here and then I drop the price to you know thirteen dollars and I get a bunch of people and twelve dollars I get a bunch of people and so this curve starts to become a lot smoother you could imagine just zooming out of this um, if these quantities were high enough and I'd have a nice smooth curve so that's normally the way we're going to draw it just to make things easier um, and so it's going to look more like this and so you could either if it's helpful, you could imagine these quantities being high enough where I could zoom out and it looks nice and smooth. And if I zoomed in, I'd have that kind of step curve going on there. Um, or really what we're doing is we're allowing fractional, we're going to allow for fractional units, even though we're usually not going to have to deal with fractional units. But um, I can buy 1.3 tacos if I want at some price. And then, um, you know, whatever my willingness to pay is, is going to be on my demand curve. So basically, we're going to assume that our demand curve is smooth and downward sloping like this. And um, I'll usually draw it as a straight line, but sometimes you'll see it as a curve like this. And later on, we're going to bring in how to think about different shapes of our demand curves. Now we're not going to worry about that too much. But basically, you can start to see what this would mean. Because if the price starts to get really low and I want a lot more of it, then um, you might have a curve that, that looks more like this. We're usually just for simplicity, we're going to just draw it as a straight line. Um, and often we're just going to use arbitrary labels. So I have P1, P2, Q1, Q2 um, for some arbitrary price and quantity. Obviously, these are bigger quantities than this. These are higher prices. OK, now, key thing that we need to keep in mind is the difference between demand and quantity demanded. So quantity demanded is always a point on your demand curve. 
So the quantity demanded at P1 is Q1. The quantity demanded at P2 is Q2. And again, we're assuming that our demand curves are downward sloping. We will see exceptions to that later, but that's our general assumption, which we call the law of demand. Um, so essentially price drops, other thing being equal, um, more people want to buy, right? Which, which kind of makes sense. So if all you're doing is dropping the price, and for now we're not worried about why this price might be changing, but if all I'm doing is dropping the price, then we would say that demand is not changing. Demand is the whole curve. Demand is this particular relationship um, holding whatever assumptions we want to make about uh, the time period or whatever else we're looking at, um, some particular market. So the demand is just this particular relationship between price and quantity. So the entire curve is demand. If I'm just moving along the curve, the curve hasn't changed. We would say quantity demanded has changed. So price drops, quantity demanded goes up. Price increases, quantity demanded goes down, and it's moving along the curve that, that way. So it's just important to keep our terminology precise. Um, this is not a demand change if we are just moving along the curve, and the reason to be moving along the curve is if the price changes. Um, when something other than the price changes that affects this market, it's going to create a new demand curve, it's going to shift the curve, um, then that would be a change in demand. So what can shift this curve? I'm just going to run through our major shifters. So an increase in demand is going to be a shift to the right. So for now, we want to think about shifts to the right and left. Um, later on, we'll see it might make sense in some context to think about shifting up and down. For now, um, we want to think at a given price, quantity demanded is higher. At P2, this was my old quantity demanded. This is my new quantity demanded. Quantity demand is increasing at each price. So that's that's an increase in demand. If it was a decrease, which I didn't show here, that would just be a shift to the left. So what's going to cause this? Number one, there's a number of buyers, number of consumers making up this market. So remember my example, I surveyed 10 people. Well, imagine if I surveyed 1,000 people, then at each price, I'd have a lot more quantity. And so that would be a shift in demand, right? So increase or decrease. Um, then we could have an inco income change. So if all of a sudden people have more income, then um, imagine I surveyed you, your willingness to pay for that taco, and uh, you just got an extra thousand dollars. Well, your willingness to pay will probably be higher, which means at each price I'll probably get more takers than before. And so that would be an increase in demand. Now that makes an assumption that this is what we call a normal good. For a normal good, when income goes up, demand goes up. So most of the goods that we probably think about are going to be normal goods, and usually we'll assume that unless we specify uh, otherwise, unless we're trying to uh, think about the other case, which is an inferior good. So any good where if your income goes up, you're actually going to buy less of it at each given price. So any kind of like lower quality good that you might su substitute um, into or out of depending on your income change. So I often use the example of ramen noodles. You know, if your income is lower, are the things being equal, then um, I'm buying more ramen noodles. And if my income goes up, I'm going to substitute out of that and you know go buy something else. So my demand would decrease for an inferior good if my income goes up. And so this is also vice versa the other direction. So income goes down, demand goes down. Um, income goes down over here, demand goes up. So just think about an example, you know, of an inferior good, and um, and it's easy to remember that relationship. Okay, substitute something that I'm going to tend to switch into um, as an alternative to this good. So it's helpful to think of an example. So let's say hamburgers and hot dogs are going to be my substitutes, and so this good, let's say this particular market that I'm looking at is for burgers, and so the substitute is going to be the hot dog. Right, so the price of hot dog gets more expensive. This is a substitute, which means I'm more likely to buy this good. Right, so we're really thinking, are you more or less likely to buy this good when something changes? So the price of that substitute, price of that hot dog goes up, I'm more likely to buy burgers, demand increase for burgers. And again, you could go in the other direction as well. A complement is something that you would tend to buy with this good. Um, so an example might be something like milk and cookies. Um, so let's say this is the market for cookies. 
right? Milk's going to be my complement. So I tend to consume milk and cookies together. Doesn't mean everyone has to consume them together. Doesn't mean that you always have to consume them together. But as long as this relationship holds for some people in the market so that it affects this market, then we can treat them as complements. So if, say, the price of, what did I say, this is cookies? So if the price of milk goes up and I tend to consume that with cookies, well, now I'm less likely to buy cookies. Right, so it's get the opposite relationship with the with the substitute. And again, rather than memorize a list of rules here, if you just think of the example and just think about the logic, then it's easy to remember. Right, so burgers, hot dogs, whatever you know, pick. Think of another pair that you want to use. Um, right, hot dog goes up, less more likely to buy burgers in this case. Right, milk versus cookies. Just think about the example. Right, milk price of milk goes up less likely to buy cookies. So then it's easy to remember these rules, right? And just think about a, what might be an inferior good that you want to use for that. Um, so, that, so you shouldn't really be memorizing a list like this. Expectations. So in particular, expectations about the future price of this good. So let's say um, this is something that I expect to be more expensive next month than other things being equal. What's going to be happening to demand right now? I'm more likely to buy right now, right? So I'm going to be and you can see what's going to happen is that as people anticipate that future price increase, they're buying more now, well, that's going to tend to drive up the price as soon as we put this market together with, with supply and demand. So we're just responding, and again, it's just logical, just responding to those future expectations. If I expect it to be cheaper later, I'm less likely to buy it now. So um, just lost my list here. Um, less likely to buy them now, so that would be a demand decrease. Um, our last category for now this is just kind of a catch-all category if I can't think of another place to put it. You know, could be any kind of preference change that affects demand for this good. So people just decide um, they uh, like eating burgers more than before or whatever it is, then uh, that could be a demand increase. Um, you know, the responding to some news story could be anything. People's tastes change over time. Not really much else we can say other than just that being a, a given information that we're going to be responding to.